I want to go talk to uh, Hugh Johnson. Uh, Hugh Johnson, as I told you before, immediate past president of the Jamaica Small Business Association. But he's speaking this morning in his capacity as a member of the State of the African Diaspora and also as one of the organizers of the direct flight to Ghana, the upcoming direct flight to Ghana. Good morning, Mr. Hugh Johnson. How are you doing? Good morning, Kabu. I'm doing well. All right. To your listeners, good morning. Right. Thank you so much for your patience. We're joining you just a little bit late. But, um, uh, well, uh, the two things, the State of the Africa Union and also the uh, upcoming trip to Ghana. But quickly, you're no longer the, the president of a small business association? Correct. Um, for almost a year now, yes. we have a new president, still on the board as a media past president, but no longer in the driver's seat. Okay, se. all right. Well, you had a good innings, great work, and uh, welcome to this other side now where you're looking at Africa. So you've got Africa in your sights in a serious way. Correct, correct. Mm-hmm. All right, so first of all, we talk about the state of the Africa Union. What is that exactly? Um, is this the state of the African diaspora is different from the African Union. The state of um, Africa is made up was made up of five regions: North, South, East, West, and Central. Yes. For about 13, 14 years now, the African Union got together and legislated to create a sixth region. Yes. That sixth region comprises um, over three hundred and fifty million Africans living outside of continental Africa. Mm-hmm. But over the last three, four years, um, the then president of the African Union got together and appointed um, Dr. Louis George Tin to lead that sixth region, that 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 group of persons, mm-hmm. and he has set out to create a virtual government, a borderless government, which we have in place. Members of Parliament in many countries around the world ministers of government, ambassadors, and it is functioning and creating ways and bringing the diaspora to Africa and the African continent to the diaspora. All right, so so let us say that slowly. So you're saying that, all right, so the, the, the sixth region, uh, because CARICOM talks about the sixth region, the government of Jamaica talks about the sixth region, the Reparations Commission, the Reparations Council, and the um, CARICOM Reparations Council, they all talk about the sixth region. Um, how does this, the state of the Africa diaspora um, that you're speaking of, how does this fit in with all of uh, all these other institutions that have uh, somehow tapped into that sixth region? Is this, is, does this in, uh, encapsulate everybody? What's the umbrella uh, group? Okay. The six, as you know, the sixth region is the African diaspora living outside of Africa. And we yes. are signing the state of the African diaspora. We have been signing um, treaty agreement, cooperative agreement with all these many states, functional f- f- functionaries around that are um, Pan-African is Afrocentric and promoting the same agenda. That's our aim, objective, and it's happening seamlessly. Just to tell you that just two weeks ago, um, the State of the African Diaspora, we have launched our university, and we have had... All right, so before you go to the university, so basically what you're saying is that this is separate and apart from what government agencies and CARICOM would be looking at. This is a, this is a separate body, the state of the, African, um, the Africa diaspora. Correct. Correct. All right. And, and, um, but one of the things I heard you say, though, is that, there, that, that there's a person who was tapped to, to lead the, the, the formulation. So who tapped that person? The, the African, the, the AU. The African, African Union. Union. Right, and this person is now a part. Who, who, could you remind us of his name? Dr. Louis George Finn. So, so, all right, so Dr. Louis George Finn? Finn, T-I-N. Finn. So Dr. Louis George Finn is part of a state of the Africa diaspora. He's the prime minister. He's the leader of that body. Of right, the so he's been asked by the Africa Union 
to, to to drive this but he's but he's doing this outside of government he's doing this with um just ordinary people he's doing this with different groups across the african diaspora correct and, okay. and countries because so far um countries have signed in have signed in um, signed cooperative agreement with the state of the African diaspora and it's growing by the day. Yes. Who, who are the countries involved? Can you say what, what countries are involved? Um, I'm not sure. No. What I can do, um, Kabul, is to invite the PM next week on your program or when you have time yes. to explain the, the whole ramification and the workings of that to you, which will give you a broader perspective. All right. On the well, Okay, okay. All right, so we'll, we'll get that together. All right, so in the meantime, um, wh what has happened so far? Because you talk about a prime minister, so it seems as if there's a government in place. Correct. All right, can you tell us about the government? Um, we have, so far, um, over 300 um, members of parliament across the globe mm -hmm. and ministers of government. And I, I was sharing with you the... the, the glorious news of this university that was launched and so far even at Jamaica University UCC have signed cooperative agreement with that university already mm -hmm. and many other universities around the world yes and so the university that's launched is based where it's a virtual university because as you see the situation now has pushed us to a different of realm. course of course yes there. Yeah, learning learning is going to be for the most part, and especially at the tertiary level, virtual for for so many. Um, so, so this university is now has now been launched, and um, is it up and running, or are you just about getting it together? It is up and running with over twenty faculties as we speak and growing. And how many students? Um, thousands of students. Mm -hmm. I'm unable to give you a figure on yeah. that. No. And it's called the State of the African Diaspora University. University of the State of the African Diaspora. All right, so we, we and we can find that online. Correct. All right, Correct. so for our listeners who want to, more information on that, you could always go online and, and, and check that. Um, yeah. All right, uh, yes, go ahead, Hugh. A, a part of our greater mission, when they claim to give us political independence, um, the colonial masters, they held back economic independence. Mm. And that is one of our mandates to claim that and take it. Mm -hmm. We're doing it through um, two major plans right now is, is education, re-educate our populace, and through economic gain, economic activities by doing business among ourselves. As you would have known, um, nations that have allowed their currency, their money to circulate longer within their economy, create wealth and build their economy while the black race, the world over, it doesn't stay among us for more than six hours. And for that, we are where we are. Mm -hmm. We intend to change that by, first of all, start to doing business among ourselves. And as you know, in business, business is 90% relationship, 10% product. Mm -hmm. We are building that relationship with our brothers and sisters on the continent. Mm -hmm. Ghana is known as the gateway to Africa. Mm -hmm. And for so doing, we are planning our inaugural trip from Jamaica to Ghana. All right, so you take us right to the inaugural trip from Jamaica to Ghana. So this is a trip that was planned for earlier this year, right? Correct, but it, it was postponed because of the whole COVID issue and other reasons. Yes, and so now the trip is on, a, a direct from Jamaica to Ghana. Um, when is this scheduled for? The 22nd of October. So you're talking about in a, in a few weeks. In another 18 days. Yeah. Um, th so this is, this is a, a direct trip, which means that it is also a chartered flight, right? Correct. Talk to us about that. Um, as you know, normally when you're going to Africa, you would have to go all the way around Europe. Across the Atlantic, it's less than 10 hours flight, and mm -hmm. it would take a 30, 40 hours around Europe to get to mm -hmm. Africa mm -hmm. with expense that we can least afford. So we believe, just as we came direct across the Atlantic, we should go back direct across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And this, this, this arrangement for the flight, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this arrangement for the flight to take us directly from Kingston to Ghana. From Kingston to Ghana. What airline? Um, it's a chartered flight, and uh, I'm not. Uh, um, 
I can't disclose the 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 the, the airline. All right, it's so it's a, a charter, charter. It's a chartered flight. This plane is chartered and it's going straight from Jamaica to 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 Ghana on October twenty two. Um, do you do you now have a, a full flight? Um, I would need to check that out. It was filling up pretty fast. So, mm-hmm. who are interested, I would urge them to to to, to log on um, and to be assured of that because mm-hmm. I'm getting calls by the day, and All since right. I'm not directly dealing with that, mm-hmm. I would need to consult in order to answer you. How can how can persons who are interested in this flight be a part of this flight? Um, call three four five four six eighty two. 4782, that is 345 4, 48 48 not sorry, 819 eight, one, nine, two, twelve. All right, Hugh, eight, all right, Hugh, go over those numbers for me, please, slowly. 345 Five zero eight one nine two two one two. All right. Um, what can you tell us about the the cost and uh, um, hotel accommodation and what the what the what the tour includes? Um, the itinerary has already um, established. We'll be going to the castle. We'll be going to all of the attractions of course you mean, of course by the castle you mean the dungeons right right right, right. That, right. Uh, so, so you'll be going to the dungeons you'll be going to where else um the the graveside the the, the slave river oh, you're going is, to i mean as in manso as in manso we'll be going to the ashanti kingdom to meet the king that's in kumasi and, right we'll yes. be meeting also and we'll be going up in the mountains and we'll be mm-hmm. meeting um dignitaries in Africa, governmental personnel. Okay. Um, what's the cost? Um, $4,300. $4,300 US dollars, which is a giveaway at this time because mm-hmm. as you would have known, it can cost anywhere between six and 10000 US to get to Ghana anytime. All right, and so we're for- doing it for Four thousand, four thousand US dollars. This is for how many days? Um, eleven days. Four thousand US dollars, eleven days. It's a direct trip from from Jamaica straight to Ghana. It's leaving in eighteen days uh, from Kingston, Jamaica. I must congratulate you on this. I know that a few months ago um, we tried to do one from Nigeria. Well, not me, but the uh, got the uh, Jamaica High Commission to Nigeria along with others and, and that was cancelled at the very last minute. As a matter of fact, that was cancelled on the day and so that people are a little bit concerned um, after so much promotion had gone into it. Um, uh, so how do you now um, really ease people's fears? Those who are listening now and want to to go, but to say, oh boy, you know, so what happened with Nigeria? They last just did a few months ago, them cancelled on the day when the flight will leave. How do you ease those fears and to say to persons, this flight will happen? Um, I can only assure them by telling them that we are resolute, we have a plan, we are determined to bridge the gap between Africa and the diaspora, and we would understand the, the disappointment in that we were disappointed too and I want to share with you that it was out of that disappointment that we say let's do it because um, as you would have known we don't have the sway or the authority over governmental agency as they operate Mm -hmm. and they choose to act in a particular way Mm -hmm. and um, we believe that business need to be left to business people to run because on this inaugural flight um, Kabul Mm -hmm. we'll be having a lot of business persons yes companies agencies Mm -hmm. seeking to do substantive business with their brothers and sisters Mm -hmm. on the continent that carries 1.4 billion market yes Uh, brilliant it sounds really good so so what about visa issues Um, obviously that's not a consideration visa from Jamaica to Ghana no, no, no longer a consideration because Ghana did say 
last year that we don't need visas. So, so and and you have double checked on that, right? Yes, we are. <laughs> Just say, we right. are. No visa requirement, no yeah. vaccine requirement. The only requirement is yellow fever. Right. Well, you do uh, well, and that's a vaccine, though. You know, so you do need the va- you do need the uh, yellow fever vaccine, and I mean that. The I'm yeah. referring to the period one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking about <laughs> the COVID nineteen. All right. So no vaccine, no COVID nineteen vaccine requirements. But you will be required if you're traveling to Ghana to travel with a vaccine passport, and that would be for the um, for the yellow fever um, vaccine. Um, and, and of course, the yellow fever vaccine can only be had in certain places. So, for example, the Comprehensive Health Clinic and maybe another clinic in, in, in Montego Bay. So for persons who have not yet signed on and they're going to be doing that today or, you know, in the, in the few days ahead, um, what should they know about vaccination? The um, ye- yellow fever. These, these numbers that they would have called would have given them a, a, a comprehensive um, list of things and yes. we are running advert we are running um friday was mm-hmm. one of our um yellow fever vaccine blitz where they accommodate us mm-hmm. uh, the, it was one of their regular days but because we had um substantive am- amount of persons mm-hmm. who were willing to do it yes. they are low they, they arrange for that so that can be arranged call any of those numbers and you'll be guided accordingly all right so once again just to say that the direct flight from Jamaica to Ghana is scheduled to leave on October 22 for 11 days for 4,000 U.S. dollars. And uh, um, once again, give us the numbers, Hugh. Um, 345 Two, two, one, two. All right. Thank you and so much. Hmm? There's also a WhatsApp number, which is 858-4918. All right. 8-4918. That's a WhatsApp number that you can send text your message to that number, and they, you'll be guided accordingly also. All right. Thank you so much, my brother. Hugh Johnson, immediate past president of the Jamaica Small Business Association. He's on top of this, and the flight leaves. is scheduled to leave on October 22 from Kingston. Once again, thank you so much, my brother. You're welcome. All right. Thank you for having me. All right. All right. We're back with you inside of the Africa Forum. It is Running Africa. And by the way, we're going to go live now to the Netherlands to speak with my sister and colleague, Aldith Honka. But just to say uh, quickly that later on in the program, we're going to be reading a letter, an open letter from the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, PM Abiy Ahmed. He has written to an open letter to the President of the United States, Joe Biden. And, you know, it reminds me in some ways, in some ways, to the speech given by His Majesty, the Emperor Haile Selassie, at the League of Nations, it just reminds me of that in many ways. There's a lot happening in Ethiopia, some of which we're not necessarily paying attention to. And uh, we'll get a lot of what we're getting about what's happening in Ethiopia is from the Western media. So here's a problem we have. And the Western media, for once, they don't all agree on what's happening in Ethiopia, depending on whether they're on the side of the U.S. or if they've taken another side that is yet unknown. And, or if they're on, and even though we talk about the Western media, we understand, right, China. Or if they're on the side of China, we're still talking about the Western media here. So, later on in the program, we're going to be reading that letter from Prime Minister Abe Ahmed, uh, a bold letter, I might say, to the President of the United States of America. So, we've been telling you that the, a Dutch court has ruled that border police can use ethnicity as one of the criteria for selecting people for checks at the border. And uh, we wanted to look a little deeper into what actually happened. So we have on the line my sister, Aldith Hunker, 
Aldith is a broadcaster. She's a journalist in the Netherlands. She hosts radio talk shows and music programs. She's a former news anchor with National Television News and the presenter of a wide range of social and cultural programs. The first African Caribbean in the Netherlands to host these wide variety of programs that we're talking about. She's no stranger to Jamaica, as a matter of fact. She was traveling back to the Netherlands when this news broke. Good morning, my sister. Yes, good morning, Kabu, and good morning to the whole running African family. You you traveled back from Jamaica to the Netherlands on the day that this story broke. I tried calling you to say, oh, this, I think they're going to take you up the line. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Well, you know, it's been, it's been yes. festering for a little while, but the actual yes. news of the um, of the court ruling did, did come on the day I was traveling. So I missed mm-hmm. your calls. I'm so sorry to yes. say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, but here's the thing. Um, so, okay. To be, this is a headline that to be Dutch is to be white, and this is what the the court uh-huh. has ruled. But you just said this is something that's been going on for a while. So, were who's surprised by this? To be honest, zero people are actually surprised, but many are very uh, indignant about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the matter of ethnic profiling is, is an ongoing thing in the Netherlands, and we're finding more and more examples of it in, in government organizations. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the, the thing is, everybody acts surprised every, every time something comes out. But, but mm-hmm. we, we've been knowing this for decades that it's been going on. All right, give us a back. Specific- yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Uh, the specific thing about this is that it's actually a court ruling uh, mm-hmm. saying that, you know, uh, the, the, the royal military police who are in charge of immigration at the airports are allowed to use ethnic profiling as long as it's part of a series of criteria. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing about these criteria is very um, diffused because when asked what those criteria are, uh, the answer given was, well, you know, uh, men walking swiftly at the airport, being well-dressed and looking non-Dutch. Mm-hmm. But, and, and that takes us to the, to the specific case, doesn't it? Uh, so, so talk to us about the specific case that was, that was taken to court to challenge ethnic profiling. What can you tell us about that yes. case? Well, this was a, a former local politician named Mpanzumpa Menga, who uh, got sick of being uh, fully checked every time he entered the Netherlands from from some sort of uh, business travel. And uh, he was always taken out of line, and uh, so he he filed a complaint, to which he got no response from the Royal Military Police. And then he took it to court together with uh, Amnesty International and a couple of other Dutch human rights organizations. And and, and these organizations, uh, organizations... in my opinion, rightfully state that this kind of ethnic profiling is in direct disaccord with the first article of our constitution, which states that all those living in the Netherlands shall be treated equal regardless of religion, race, gender, or whatever other grounds. Now, this judge has ruled that ethnicity, like I was saying, ethnicity Mm -hmm. can be used as long as it's not the only criterion, but the rest of the criteria are really diffused. So mm-hmm. it does raise the question of who does look Dutch. You, you have to understand, Kabu, that 14.2% of Dutch citizens have a non-white background. But we are not talking about the 10.7%, which is almost the same number of Dutch citizens, who also have foreign roots, but who just happen to be white. They mm-hmm. do not get pulled out of line. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, the Dutch uh, immigration said that, uh, no, the, 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 the judge said that immigration is allowed to use ethnicity, um, like I said, to determine if, if somebody entering the country is there on illegal grounds or not. Mm-hmm. So why are, are they not pulling out anybody with an immigration background and only, you know, people of color? Mm-hmm, That's the question mm-hmm, now. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So this ruling, obviously, uh, and this is why the headlines are really correct. The headlines um, are speaking to the ruling that to be Dutch is to be white and that this is now official. This was um, known uh, in terms of uh-huh. how um, institutions and organizations function in the Netherlands. And we've had a conversation about racism in the Netherlands before, right? And talking uh-huh. about um, uh-huh. uh, Black Pete and, and all of that. Uh, yes. So, so, so uh, I, I look then at the 
uh, uh, Dutch people. You're talking about Dutch citizens just now. Who who make up who make up the citizenry and 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 where do uh, where where are these people coming from? Where 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 are the the African um, black um, skinned African uh, Dutch the uh, and other ethnicities? How did they come yes. to the Netherlands and where and from where? Over time. Well, there's, there's a whole variety. I mean, people like myself. I'm mm-hmm. a black Dutch person, mm-hmm. and I am a, a Dutch person because of colonial history, right? I mm-hmm. was born in Suriname, and I am actually multi, uh, multi-ethnic multi myself, but, uh, you know, to the Dutch viewer, I look, I look black. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I am Dutch because of history, but there's also people coming in from countries like, uh, you know, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, uh, all, all over Africa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. People coming in from Asia, and now we, we've, we've got refugees coming in from Afghanistan, Syria, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. But the point is, we have an, we have this constitution in the Netherlands that once you live in the Netherlands, whether or not you have a Dutch passport, you have the same rights as everybody else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is this is what's being breached now. And, right. and and in the meantime, a judge gets to say that I do not look Dutch because of the skin, uh, the color of my skin. Right. So, so is there, what are we going to do about this? Well, that's country? a question. What, what's the level of outrage? What, what is being done, if anything? I understand that there is an appeal on the ruling. Mm-hmm. But, but how, are, uh, how, how is the community, um, the mul- multi-ethnic community, responding to this ruling? Oh, people are infuriated. I, I, was, I was watching this online when I was still in Jamaica. You know, I just got, came back, like you said, mm-hmm. and I was watching this online and... There, there, there have been petitions, one that I signed myself, mm-hmm. uh, newspapers uh, are crying out about this in, in, in Dutch uh, talk shows. People have been talking about it. But the thing with the Dutch, you know, they love to talk and they don't like to draw conclusions. So it's just person A saying something and person B saying the next and then we move on to the next subject. Mm-hmm. And we must keep in mind that the Dutch cabinet earlier this year, we spoke on that as well, yes. the Dutch cabinet fell over an ethnic profiling situation at the tax office. Yes. So we, yes. Had, we had new elections mm-hmm. and they've been trying to form a new cabinet ever since, which is more than six months already. Mm-hmm. So how in a country where this is happening, can a judge actually rule that it's okay to decide who is Dutch and who is not? And then to do so, and then to do so yeah. um, in, in, in the worst way possible, by skin uh-huh. color, you know, to uh-huh. say that uh-huh. um, to be Dutch really is to be white, cementing that idea uh, and lumping together yeah. skin color and nationality. Um, and illegality, don't forget that. Mm-hmm. Is, is, this uh-huh. to, is, is this now taking it a step too far? And, 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 and with all the conversation, you talk about no nece- necessarily not coming to a, not necessarily coming to a decision. Um, is, 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 do you think this is taking it one, t- one step too far with Black Pete, with the cabinet recently, and now this? Uh, I, I certainly believe so. We have, we have to wait to see what happens when um, this um, judicial error, this is not me saying this, this is Dutch lawyers calling it a judicial error. Mm-hmm. It will be taken to the Court of Appeal. I'm not pretty, I'm not sure when the date of that will be. I, I, I tried to look it up, but it's, I, I don't think it's, it's clear yet. Mm-hmm. When the mm-hmm. Court of Appeal, uh, if the Court of Appeal were to decide that this judge made a right decision, I really don't know what's going to happen because um, th- th- this is possibly going to end up really ugly. Wow. Um, for, for us here, I w- but you know, sometimes it, it pays to lance the sword, to lance the, um, the post-fill st- swords um, to, to, to heal the wound, you know. And um, maybe this is something that has to happen, not just in the Netherlands, but in so many other countries. But we've been looking yeah. at the Netherlands for some time. You know, for, for, for ourselves here in Jamaica, I'm quite sure that we can identify with the Dutch East Indies, you know, the Dutch Antilles. Yes. You know, these are conversations we have. And th- these are words we just throw out without even thinking um, too much about it when we talk about the Dutch Antilles or the Dutch East Indies, you know. And so that if you think about colonization, if you think about slavery and colonization, and the fact that the Dutch participated 
in slavery uh, and and colonized um, Caribbean countries and colonized um, yeah. people generally, and yeah. then to turn over and, and and to beat the hell out of black people to say that you are not African, take yeah. your African name away, and you are you are Dutch, and then to turn around. They, 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 were, they were among the worst colonizers. We have to say this. Yes. yes. Go ahead. And, and then to turn, turn around. around yeah. And then to turn around and, and and a ruling like this ruling like this comes out of of the courts. It baffles the mind. You know. It does. But you have to know, from, from a personal level, uh, Kabu, every time I speak in public and I say we, meaning we the Dutch, mm-hmm. it, 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 I have to add a sentence to explain to them why I call myself Dutch. Oh, This, this is so ingrained in culture and yes. it, it's, it's a very difficult conversation to have here in the Netherlands yes. because people, people were brought up in school... Uh, not knowing about these things. So even today, we have to keep reminding people why I have every right to call myself Dutch. Mm -hmm. Not even from the time I've been living in the Netherlands, but from the day I was born. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. this is something that the Dutch really do not understand for some reason. So it's going to take a while. It sends sends another message to us because um, we saw recently, not so recent, um, where the UK, uh, you know, has been kicking out uh, the Caribbean people. I think maybe with Brexit, Mm -hmm. they're, they're having a change of mind. And um, yeah, and, the and, thing. Yes. yeah, and, mm-hmm. and and mother, you know, the the the, the motherland became um, for, to to a lot of uh, you know black people who went Caribbean people who went in who thought they were English to boot, you know, mm-hmm. that they were booted out. Uh, and so, mm-hmm. but the message that that is sending to us, whether we want to yes or no, basically this is what it's saying. I think whether you are ready for it, yes or no. Um, return to your roots, return to your source, identify yourself as who you are. Uh, mm. uh, race first, as Marcus Garvey would say, more more, and then um, everything afterwards. Because if we begin to claim, I think, our African heritage, wherever we are, whether it's in, in Europe or the continent of Africa, because there's so many who who would identify as other on the continent of Africa yeah. with, or within the Caribbean, then it, a ruling like this is, isn't, do you, to what extent do you think a ruling like this um, is pushing us toward uh, saying, you know, rejecting the, the colonial monikers? Well, well I'm, I'm, cert- I'm certain it will uh, be a big factor in that. But the, the, the question is, persons like myself or this, this poli- ex-politician I'm, uh, we're talking about, Mr. Bam- uh, Bamenga, what does it tell us to do? It, it, does it tell me, for example, to stop identifying as a Dutch person? I believe I have a right to that. Even, even if it's only a historical right. I have the right to my passport. I have a right to all the, uh, the rights and, and duties that I have as a Dutch person. If I take away that myself, I'm giving in. That's the way I feel about it. Mm-hmm. But right, because this is, a, this is a complex conversation, isn't it? It's not just linear. You know, you really do have to look at the many, the, the many strands of this and the different elements, multifaceted, really. Uh, and so I don't think that this is a one, one-off conversation to have. But for African people, I think it's saying something that so many in Europe... Um, uh, 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 European countries I'm talking about, governments have been treating Africans yeah. away. We're, we're, uh, I'm, I'm looking, for example, at what the, the, the so-called migrant problem um, that we see, we're seeing in Spain and Italy and, and, and other uh-huh. Euro- European countries and the way Africans, continental Africans, are being treated. And it, 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 it is uh-huh. sending a message, I think, to black people to say it definitely is. we need to have a conversation what part? Who's, who's to, who is to lead the conversation? Uh, who are we going to con- converse with? And this who is will a, be listening? And this is the question I was going to pose to you now to say what part, <laughs> what, 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 what do you think um, the, what part reparations and the conversation within reparations and the reparations commission, CARICOM reparations commission, we have um, reparations um, councils across Europe and so on. What role do you think that space can play and provide in facilitating this conversation. Marcus, yeah, we tell we say we're not gonna know ourselves until we're back is against the wall. Mm-hmm. And every time our back is against the wall, we are forced into that reservoir of memory, like how oh, you make Kenke from memory. Yes, thank we you for that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's a heritage. Yes, but it's also yes. personal. Yes. And we are forced to go into our memory and say how we do this. How yes. we do this. Yes. Those doctors from the Kingston Public Hospital who who took it upon themselves in a beautiful way a few months ago and start to show us how to make turmeric tea. Where then get it from? Uh -huh. Then we go there and go experiment with mm -hmm, all the things that mm -hmm. said turmeric can make tea for certain things. Mm -hmm. No, we always knew that. When we had chick leave and people start calling and say, Look here, what did doctor them tell you now work, you know? If if you get three leaves, they never said two, them never say one. Three mm -hmm. leaves of this thing. And if you pound it, them never say boil it. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth. Yes. And yes. all the things we are we are remembering now in this COVID crisis about all the fruits and foods that we have which are anti-inflammatory yes. and we are used up with ginger and we go back and take skellion and thyme and make tea and drink it and so on and so forth that is science yes. so yes. so let me just digress a little bit to say when people start saying I don't know more than doctor I don't know hear doctor say I don't do X, Y and Z mm -hmm. then in my head is then where did doctor them learn yes. where them are called science from yes. now from mm -hmm. these same people that I don't know are called duns right. who will run go to and say how, how, how we make tanky from yes. memory yes. so it is it is always there <clears throat> forgive me it is mm -hmm. always there Um, we need not to wait until our back are against the wall. No. We need to be sharing the conversation. And one of the things that COVID has taught us is that when we depend on lockdown, we we feel change that the word. Part <laughs> of what the word do. Yes. Is to affect our consciousness in a different way. Yes, I, way. I, I, really, so I agree. <laughs> resistance. Yes. And we, we, we are that stress. Yes. And everybody knows there was stress is a killer. You know why I'm laughing, Amina? Because we because we also have no movement day, right? And I'm saying, but no movement day is interesting, you know, because it, 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 you, you, you lock into your head that you're not even supposed to exercise. You know, for go to exactly. door, you know, for door. So, so what? So, <laughs> so when you are locked down. <laughs> oh, I'm putting Sunday light for this. You have to move. Yes. And the coconut and make the carrot juice right. and go fireside. So yes. even the way it affects yeah. our consciousness. Yes. And and we have learned that in these days, we return to an understanding. If we take the stress out of it, we yeah. return to an understanding of family time. Yes, yes. And how important. And even that, that is, and then we go right back to heritage, don't it? Because we, I know my age, Amina, right? I born in the late 60s, right? I grew up in a situation where evening time, you sit on the veranda and the extended family, great grandmother, grandmother, who the near come forward, and uh, whether you listen to Dulcimina or you're talking stories, or or but it's a family time situation, and it happened in rural Jamaica in every home. Um, in the community that I grew up. No, we have lost that, and this is why I want to go back to the point of um, so um, in terms of so, um, active reflection. You know, on, on heritage, and we look at what do we save and what do we not save. Whose responsibility is it to, 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 to ensure? I know you are doing a brilliant job in ensuring that a lot of that which we have lost or we seem to be losing, that, that, and, and that's worth saving, that we're saving, like storytelling. I mean, that's brilliant and, and that's critical. But whose responsibility is it? All right, so I want to go back to Marcus Garvey, who said, in good look around and say, who then is the black man's king? Yes. And he not see none, and him say, well, I must see me. <laughs> and <laughs> that's my paraphrase of what happened. Yes. I must see me. Yes. Because yes. when we look at Garvey's response yeah. to our lack at that time, yes. in terms of positive images and so on, and Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad, what we see is... Mm. In every question that we ask, we are part of the answer. In every yes. question. So that's the first thing I want to say. Yes. The second thing I want to say is that question reminds me of when I used to live in Antigua. Yes. And there was an election. And you know how elections bring out the most creative in a way? Yes. And the party that the people them never want. They make one cartoon mm -hmm. with the party leader 
back at the people them mm. and the cartoon say there they go and I must hurry after because behold I am their leader right. <laughs> <laughs> asked and answered so, yes. <laughs> so sometimes yes, yes. we have to make the leader them run yes. back away yes, but yes. we can't and yes and leaders elected leaders um, public workers, uh, public officials, and so on, mm-hmm. are paid to look after the best interest of the people as individuals, as communities, and as a nation. Mm-hmm. But guess what? Some of the people who are elected officials, some of the people who are paid public officials like that, yeah. come out of the same pathology. Oh, uh, yes. Come out of the yes. same pathology that mm-hmm. we're trying to save mm-hmm. ourselves from and yes. to save who we are and to save what is important to us. Yeah. I so see. So then we yes. can't always depend on them to know or to know it all. Mm-hmm. What we also need to do is to form and or strengthen those mechanisms by which we say to them, come listen to me, we are going to make Kenji. Right. We are going to make Kenji. Yes. I see, and this is what China is doing now, and I, right as we speak, um, just re- going back into itself, that which it did um, 30 odd years ago before it come back out as, as world leader, going back into itself this time to say, and saying to, to its citizens that, listen, um, we are losing our heritage, we are losing our culture, and we have to return to the source, but that, that is coming from the top down. Not much resistance we're seeing, but, you know, obviously, I I suppose there might be pockets of resistance. But but do we need a situation like that where there is, not necessarily a top-down, but where the people are are somehow engaged, whether it is through education, whether it is through the church, whether it is through whatever institutions, um, on what what, what, what to save, returning to the source, um, what memories to enjoy. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of Singapore as well. Yes. Because Singapore came to realize that it had sacrificed its culture and heritage in the name of becoming an economic giant. Yes. And so they they embarked on a program. I I haven't followed how successful they have been. Yes. What Mm -hmm, we need mm -hmm. need to look at that is yes, what Mm -hmm. we need is to engage with ourselves, our youth clubs, our mother's union. We don't even know if these things still exist, you know. Because not really, not really, I mean, uh, the know, youth clubs and are... even the way yes. of honoring um, people who have lived with us. In a COVID, if we're not careful, we're going to lose it. Yes. Our people dead, and them are buried, and nobody can go. So it's like them never did live. Even that as part of our heritage. You know, right, my, right. my father died and, 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 and I, you know, the, 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 I, I can't even talk. One of the worst things that could have happened, you know, uh, although we, we really celebrated him uh, and continued to do that, is the fact that, you know, the, 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 the ritual of burial, right. we could right. not observe. And we still right. feel like we, we lost something in the, in the pandemic. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. More than our father. Yes. So, so we have to be very careful about yes. that. Yeah, that's that's the way we say goodbye or travel to the next world. It's yes. very important. Of course. The community come together. Of people course. come cry with you. Of course. Uh, we feed ourselves and we feed those who we don't see but who we know are present. Yes. As such an important part of our culture and our heritage that we just have to safeguard it as the best we can in this period of nobody go bury nobody I'm going to turn 10 hours ago and go put him down and it's done because mm-hmm. it can't it, we, the, the reverence for life mm-hmm. as part of the heritage yes we need to engage the, yes. the, the, the people who are culture workers who more and more I call development workers mm-hmm. and recently I've begun to call them spirit workers yes. the people who work in all of these fields have to be so reflective and so responsible because some of the folk songs where we sing, we should never did sing them in the first place. And that now. takes us to where, what should we keep and what should we throw out. But I mean, I guess what? I'm totally out of time, you know, so I have because we're going to. So we can chat. Uh, but we do it all the time. <laughs> 
<laughs> we do it all the time. But I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you a final word just to tie everything together as we talk about heritage and inter heritage month. All right. Well, mm-hmm. let us end with that point then. That yes. as we mount our celebrations for this month, be very co- conscious of the content that we are promoting and what that might do to young minds or young hearers or even other people mm-hmm. who say they're not them that mm-hmm. and let us reflect. Um, that content which will also shift our consciousness and take us to another level of shining Mm -hmm. when we come to celebrate what we call heritage. I love you, my sister. Love you, Sue, my sister. Dr. Amina Blackwood Meeks. We have to put the doctor on. Thank you, my sister. Thank you (laughs) so much. Well deserved. Yes. All right. right. Lots of conversation in Jamaica this week and the last two weeks, I think probably two to three weeks now, about rape in Jamaica. Um, A topic that we have discussed ad nauseum um, on this program for many, many moons on another program I used to do on Tuesday night. And um, to look specifically at attitudes to rape uh, in Jamaica in particular as opposed to other Caribbean countries and also as opposed um, to the international, to you know, the wider global community. Uh, so we're hearing uh, two things. One, I watched this interview with uh, my sister Tanya Stevens and you know my heart my heart um to her um tanya um told her story uh, she's been talking about this for the while for a while but i think this is the first time that she has actually sat down and told her story to anyone publicly in this way about how she was raped as a 17 year old and um, by someone she said was a prominent entertainer in jamaica and i think this is the first time that she has come this close to naming who the person actually um, is, who um, she says r- her when she was 17. And then she also talked about being raped, being gang raped, literally, um, in the home of a friend, um, a friend whose father was a policeman, so that's in, a, in the home of a police officer uh, sometime after. And, and I know it must have been very painful for you, my sister, to speak about that. To publicly talk about that so many years after, I could still feel your pain, still see your pain, and I know you're dealing with this in the best way that you possibly can. But what Tanya has done is that she has given um, Jamaican women a voice to bawl out, to speak out. And I know she, and I, can, I could hear in the interview that she, 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 she is thinking about you know, the time that it took to speak out and so on. But Tanya, no, my sister, you, you know, time is relative. And so you're talking about it now. It just happened. You know, whenever you talk about it, that's when it is. So, 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 so speak your truth. Speak your truth. And know that you've got sisters who've got your back on this one. Um, for, for many moons, you've talked about being assaulted but you've, I've never heard you come out in the way that you've come out. You've motivated others and you've given others a voice and the strength to say, me too, me too. And I hope Jamaican women who are listening to Tanya Stevens will find the strength to come out and ball out. This is, this is, we did a series of programs in this space called Ball Out. You must ball out, you know, um, when you feel comfortable to talk, to ball out. Don't be afraid to. Uh, and know that your sister's got you. Um, so, so Tanya has done that, and my hat's off to her, uh, and my, and my uh, a warm embrace to you, Tanya, uh, as you, you speak this truth, leave it there on the platform, leave it there in the public sphere, so that now Jamaica has a responsibility, because they can't say they didn't hear, to say, what do we do now, and how do we do it? Uh, there's another conversation of going on where um, uh, a, a, a young lady from Asia um, put out a video and she named a Jamaican artist who she says um, her. Now, one of the reasons why we're going to call the name is because the artist has come out to refute that. And so I watched that video 
I heard um, the, the young lady, and then we have, um, we're waking up this morning to reggae singer Richie Stevens categorically denying the allegations against him by a 27-year-old female entertainer and ex-soldier from Singapore. In a video posted on YouTube on Saturday, um, the Weakness for Sweetness singer poured cold water over the allegations. And um, quoting Richie, quoting Richie Stevens from the from the video, he says, Miss Elaine Lim made some allegations, some of what she said is true, but I'm here to tell you what is true. One, she was on tour with me in 2019 in Australia. Two, she made a formal report to the police against me. And three, she did a racket. What she did not tell you, a thorough investigation was done by the Australian police. I was detained. They took a statement from me. They took a statement from her and uh, other people. And there were um, cameras in the vicinity, he said. So he goes on. He goes on to, to say, while I was detained, I called my attorney, Christopher Townsend, who advised me what to do. And at the end of the investigation, they found her allegations to be simply baseless. You know what is true. He says, I'm really sorry for her to know that she would go that far to try to get some recognition. We are living in a time where they believe that likes is far more important than the truth. And we are here to bring the truth out. So... Um, that video is online. Richie Stevens refuting the allegation, categorically denying allegation of rape against him by um, a, a, an Asian. Now, so, so there's a conversation about rape that is in the Jamaican space this morning. We are to have that conversation. We must have it. Never too late. All right, you're inside of the Africa Forum. This is Running Africa, and we have other things to do, and that's why we won't spend more time on, on this subject, but it's out there, you know? <laughs> 